And this is the part where I share it to lots of groups on Facebook. And our audience kind of gets settled in with popcorn and whatever. And Mark, I have you flying through space, so I hope that's okay. Oh, it's totally fine. It looks like it's, uh, did, where did you get the video from? You know, NASA and ESA put out so many of these kinds of uh, visualizations and stuff. Yeah. They're used for, you know, educational things. So. It almost looks like uh, the visualization that uh, we did when I was on Hubble for the goods uh, deep space or deep field survey. Oh, it might have been, might have been. Um, but I haven't kept up with all the other visualizations they've come out with, so I don't know if it's the same or if it's. This does not, I don't think per se, go into the final deep field image, you know, but. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the visualization they made was just to illustrate the distances between the galaxies in the final image that was made. Oh, I see, maybe that's what it is. That's cool. But I wasn't involved in making that. I was, I was when I was on Hubble. I was doing the uh, uh, data processing and archiving of everything that came down. Oh my gosh! What a critical job that is. I got, I got to see it first, but I couldn't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> so like when the uh, Eagle Nebula, the three pillars came down. Yeah. I remember seeing it. So oh, that's kind of cool. But I had no idea what it was about, what we were doing with it or anything until oh you know a few months later when they did the press release. I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You know, uh, I was talking to Linda Spilker at JPL and just asking her what it's like to see all the data come down. She said, well, it's kind of like there's a fire hose of data coming yeah. in, okay? <laughs> and you get to sip a little, it's like you're trying to get a sip out of the water. And she says, and that's what, that's what we put on the news and that's what <laughs> goes out there initially. And that's what all the scientists see initially. But she uh. said, it's, it's a lot more data, you know, that they get to look at later so. I, I love Linda and that is so true <laughs> yeah yeah Linda and her husband are great they've done several things with us so you know I just for all the you know people like you and uh, Mark and Caitlin and uh, all the rest of the scientist um alan stern for example he's been on our program a couple of times uh you know it's all done on a volunteer basis and uh, mm -hmm. yeah i couldn't be more grateful really you know so yeah all my talks are volunteer basis yeah that's awesome and uh a couple of times people come up to me and say how much is, are they paying you to do this and it's like <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this on my own you know dime and vacation and they're like you're yeah. kidding right yeah. No, because I think this is important and I want to share it. Uh, that part's very true. You know, I wonder, you know, if there was a timeline of how, how much scientists shared what they knew, you know, I mean, uh, there's like a, uh, a woodcut of uh, Galileo, or maybe it's not a woodcut, but it's an illustration of Galileo showing people the stars with his telescope. And I think initially what what he did is he held star parties for lawyers or mm. people that are of high import, you know. Um, it was kind of elitist, but uh, um, and I get it too. I mean, you know, research scientists are trying to get a job done, and it requires an incredible amount of concentration and many many hours, and uh, and then to stack on top of it public outreach in astronomy or public outreach in science, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's also a lot of work, you know, so, so, you know, I hope that the, uh, that the audience, well, I, I know that they appreciate it. So, okay, well, let's get started. All right. 
The first up close images come in. And they shock the world. When the images first came down from New Horizons, I was stunned, excited, tired, all, all, every emotion and feeling you can imagine, but really just amazed at what they look like. This tiny world with a diameter less than 1,500 miles turns out to be incredibly complex with mountains more than a mile high. The Rocky Mountains here are beautiful and the flat irons in the background, but instead of rock, the mountains on Pluto were made of ice. And at those temperatures, ice is so cold, it's like bedrock. Pluto's most famous feature, its heart, contains a massive glacier that flows across its surface. I certainly did not expect a glacier of nitrogen and methane ices. Never in a million years did I expect that. We're seeing processes, some of which look quite familiar from the Earth, but are happening in a completely alien environment with completely alien materials. Pluto even has volcanoes made of ice. There's something that looks wow. very much like an ice volcano on Pluto. We didn't see it erupt, but it sure looks like a volcano. Using images and data collected by the spacecraft, the team created this simulation of what it would feel like to fly over Pluto's surface. Some of the geologists on our team have taken to calling Pluto the new Mars, because it's every bit as complicated what could be driving such geological diversity on such a tiny world? One theory, Pluto's surface may change with the seasons. Pluto doesn't really have uh, the, the sort of four seasons that we have. We have very even seasons. We have a hot summer and a cold winter. It's about the same length of time in each one because Earth is in a circular orbit around the sun. Pluto's not. It's in this very eccentric orbit around the sun. As Pluto, along with its largest moon, Charon, gets closer to the sun, its surface warms. But as it continues on its 248-year orbit, getting farther and farther from the sun, its surface becomes colder. So there are these extreme seasons. In summer, ices on the surface can evaporate. In winter, they can recondense. So when you see it today, it is not going to look the same as it looks in 100 years when it's in the opposite season. But there could be another strikingly different reason for Pluto's complex surface. Based on measurements of its density and chemical composition, scientists believe it has a rocky core. All rock contains radioactive elements which, as they decay, release heat. So there's a continual flow of heat from the interior of Pluto to the, to the outside, but it's a very small amount of heat because Pluto is pretty small. It doesn't have that much rock in it. But we think that even that tiny amount of internal heat is enough to move mountains, literally. And it may also be enough heat to create something extraordinary beneath Pluto's icy crust. Right now, Pluto is covered in frozen water and frozen nitrogen and a few other compounds. It's quite possible that in the past, there was enough heat internal to Pluto to melt some of that ice and create a layer of ocean. We suspect that Pluto has an ocean of liquid water deep in the interior, hundreds of miles below the surface.
Hello, everyone. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and it's my great pleasure to introduce once again Dr. Caitlin Ahrens. Caitlin is uh, a planetary researcher. She's working at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, she, in 2018, she won, um, uh, she was recognized as one of the 10 outstanding young Americans. Uh, and that's, that was um, an award uh, from the JCs. And I think that uh, another remarkable person won that award like John F. Kennedy or something. So um, we're really proud to have her on as, as well as her special guest, uh, uh, Mark, am I pronounced the last name right, Kotke? Kotke. Kotke. Okay. So yes. uh, you're going to find this to be a very special, really enlightening, wonderful presentation. And so I'm going to turn this over to you, Caitlin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott, so much for being my wonderful co-host through seven months of science. Well, so welcome back, everybody. We are near the tail end of seven months of science already. It, time has flown by so much. Oh my goodness, we are already in October and the next month will be our final month with seven months of science. So welcome to our sixth month. Uh, so I'm so excited to have our guest for tonight. We have Mark, nicknamed Indy Cocte for this evening. Now, Indy, I've known uh, for, uh, I actually did the math. We've known each other for 20 years. <laughs> so as of this summer, we've known each other for 20 years. Oh my goodness gracious. And so when I, when I first met Mark, I, he was uh, doing Hubble work at the time and I got to see his transition over to the NASA Mercury Messenger mission, uh, which was a very exciting time uh, for NASA exploration to the inner uh, and the innermost planet of our solar system. And now he is, uh, on the New Horizons mission. And so this evening, I'm so excited to hear about his wonderful journey with New Horizons and answer all sorts of cool and crazy questions we're gonna have about uh, being on the New Horizons mission for this evening. So Mark, take it away. Greetings, everyone. Um, so I've been on the New Horizons mission since uh, 2014. I uh, transitioned off of Messenger after Messenger had a uh, crash landing onto Mercury, which was planned due to lack of fuel. Um, so I got to see a number of exciting things with the mission, uh, starting with the Pluto flyby and then the flyby of Arakoff and several other things, all of which I'm going to cover this evening uh, for you. Basically, we're going to talk about the exploration of the Kuiper Belt and New Horizons role in it. So I'm gonna share my screen, bring this up. Desktop two. And you guys should be seeing slides now, yes? We see the presentation mode. You may need to do the switch mode. Uh, switch or swap displays at the top. Is that better? Yes. Okay, weird, because I swapped it so I could look at it. Now I got to not look at it to talk to you. Okay, <laughs> anyway, all good. Um, so exploring the Kuiper Belt. So to get everyone on the same page, let's talk about the solar system in general. Our solar system is incredibly complex. We have all kinds of objects in here from a star, a large plasma ball, which actually is a dwarf plasma ball compared to other stars, to rocky worlds, to icy worlds, to gaseous worlds, and all kinds of debris in between. And if you do analogs with, for our, if you look for analogs of our solar system around other stars, we have yet to find one. We found several thousand other planets around other stars. So we know of other solar systems out there, but none of them represent what ours is. So at this time, our solar system is unique from what we can tell. Someday, hopefully we will find analogs and then we will have, you know, parallel solar systems to study and understand how ours came about. But in the meantime, we are it. So what we've done uh, is we've taken and we've divided this, um, the system into basically three zones to understand the planetary formations. 
Zone one is your rocky worlds, the inner planets, Mercury, Earth, Venus, Mars, out to the uh, asteroid belt. Zone two is your gas giants, the Jovians. And it goes from the asteroid belt out to what we call the Kuiper belt. And that includes, you know, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Zone three is the realm of the icy worlds, uh, where the vast majority of the dwarf planets reside and a, a great number of other objects. This is where uh, comets come from, or one of the sources of comets. This area, what we call the Kuiper belt, is a, a, a donut-shaped uh, region that surrounds the inner zones of one and two. And there's millions of objects in this region. In addition to what are what's likely to be thousands of dwarf planets, we just haven't seen them yet. Uh, the, the, the area is huge. Uh, the, the radius extends from the inner part to the outer part from 30 to 50 astronomical units from the sun, where one astronomical unit is the mean distance between Earth and the sun. So the Kuiper belt is between 30 and 50 uh, you know, times further away from the sun than Earth is. And there's a lot of space out there to fill a lot of stuff. So uh, the first Avenger that we have for the Kuiper belt uh, is Pluto or the pluto charon system. Uh, it was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930. And when they were studying it, they realized Okay. He was looking for another planet, and he, he found this, and he said, okay, we have the ninth planet, yay, and everyone's like all excited and everything, but they start studying, you know, like, well, yeah, we have, we have something out there, and it's big, and it's, well, big relative to everything else we've seen past Neptune, which is nothing, uh, and it's round, but it has a weird, unusually elliptoidal orbit, and the orbit plane is canted at a much higher angle than the rest of the solar system. And in fact, it kind of looks like a comet orbit, but it's not a comet, it's a planet. So there was a lot of uh, un uncertainty as what this was, but since it was the only object we knew of out there of its kind, it was called a planet and lumped in with all the other planets and the definition of planet was never addressed. And we're really not gonna address the definition of planet in this talk because that's not the focus of um, the topic here, but for intents and purposes, dwarf planets are planets, just a different category. Now, the Pluto system uh, has five known, Pluto has five known companions uh, that make up the system. Charon was discovered in 1978 and was the first thought to be a moon and some people still consider it a moon, but as I will demonstrate shortly, Pluto and Charon actually orbit a point in space between the two. So they're actually a binary planetary system. So there are really our first dwarf binary system. Then the other four companions are much smaller, much tinier, much less mass, and actually orbit Pluto itself. And those would be Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx, all which were found in the 2000s. So Pluto, being so far away, is basically a dot in the sky with an arrow pointing to it. It's the only way you know it's, it's what it is. If you look at Saturn, an image of Saturn, you know what Saturn looks like. You look at Jupiter, you know what Jupiter looks like. You look at Pluto, there's a bunch of stars around it. You don't know which one it is until you look at it again a couple nights later and see which one moved. That's if, if you can remember which one moved. And even if you were at Saturn, uh, from the Cassini spacecraft in 2015, looking at Pluto, it's still a dot with an arrow pointing at it. The only way we can find this thing. Now, we've used the Hubble to study uh, Pluto. The Hubble fa produces fantastic images, you know, nebulosities and galaxies and star clusters. And it just, they're stunning, you know, things you want to print out as, you know, in, you know, 24 by 36 format and hang on your living room wall or something because they're just fantastic. But when we look at Pluto, this is what we got. And that's because Pluto is a very tiny object in the sky, whereas nebulosity and galaxies and, and star clusters actually take up much more sp space in the sky. So they're larger uh, in, in angular dimension than Pluto is. Now you can use deconvolution and you can get uh, Pluto to 
demonstrate that there's shadow regions on it. There's bright areas on it. But in the mid 90s, this is the best that Hubble was able to do. In 2010, after Hubble's one of the last one of the last servicing missions of Hubble, they got the advanced camera for surveys, and we had better detail. We had better resolution on the shadows, but it was still dark and light areas. But those dark and light areas uh, remained uh, fixed, uh, you know, as Pluto orbited. Uh, as, I mean, as it rotated on its axis, the same dark and light shadows will come about. So at this point, you know. Um, it's in 1970s, we had the Voyager spacecraft go out and we visited planets, uh, the, the gas giants, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, Pioneer also had gone out before and visited uh, Jupiter, Saturn, but no one had visited Pluto. So for over a decade, there was an attempt to get missions to go to Pluto. And they were typically canceled or they were uh, approved, but then never funded, and it just didn't happen until 2001. Uh, Alan Stern and the Pluto Underground had been the instrumental people behind all of those attempts to get a mission to Pluto, and they finally succeeded with the New Horizons spacecraft. New Horizons spacecraft was built uh, here in Maryland, uh, which is where I am, at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, we're located halfway between Baltimore and D.C., uh, it's the size, it's basically the size of a baby grand piano. You can see a couple of folks here uh, in the clean room, uh, to an idea of how big it is. You can see the uh, high gain antenna on top here. Uh, it's, as you know, as you can see, it's fixed to the side of the spacecraft. So if we want to communicate with the spacecraft using a high gain antenna, we have to turn the whole spacecraft to point to Earth. Um, now at the bottom image here, uh, this black bar that's sticking out is the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG. We have one of those. That's our power source for the spacecraft. We are far, far, far too far away to e even entertain using solar panels because the sun is just far too faint. Once you get much past Mars, solar panel efficiency drops off dramatically, and that's when you need to have these little uh, nuclear generators. There are seven science, and science instruments on board the, uh, the uh, spacecraft. Rex, Ralph, Alice, Lori, SWAT, Pepsi, and SDC. Of these seven science instruments, I want to point out that SDC has a special place in all the science instruments that are flying on spacecraft as being the only one that was fully developed, uh, fully thought of, developed, and built, and operated by students. The students who thought up this uh, instrument, a number of them got their PhDs uh, on the data returned from the instrument. And the, the group of folks you see below are, are those students. So we're flying through space about 32,000 miles an hour, um, 32, 36, depending. Um, to give you an idea how fast it is, you know, 747 on the left there, uh, when you're looking out a window traveling across the Atlantic or across the United States, uh, an SR-71 Blackbird travels a little bit faster than that, and Pluto is just wigging by. So even though we're going, you know, this speed, it still took us nine and a half years just to get to Pluto, and that was with a gravity assist from Jupiter. If we did not have that gravity assist, it would have taken us another three years to get to Pluto. So we would have gotten there just a couple years ago, as opposed to back in 2015. And our flyby time only lasted, you know, a few hours. We zipped right through the system. Uh, we had no communication with the spacecraft during the flyby, because again, we'd have to point the spacecraft to Earth to communicate with it. And if we're doing that, we cannot point the instruments to all the marvels that we were flying by. So we had to pre-program the spacecraft uh, to perform all the feats of where it has to look at the different moons, at the surface of Pluto, at Charon, back to Pluto. Uh, as we flew past, we went through the shadow uh, of both Pluto and Charon so we could see it backlit by the sun. And we had purposes for doing that, which I'll show you in just a moment. Now, as we're approaching Pluto about a month out, you can see these images we got from the spacecraft. 
And we're starting to get better resolution than the Hubble Space Telescope was. You know, we're seeing shadows, but we're starting to resolve them a little bit better. They're not so black and white. They're, there's a lot of gray in here, in addition to the dark and light areas. And then just a week out, we got this image here. Still blurry, uh, still pretty far away, but you can definitely see the what became known as the famous heart-shaped uh, Image, uh, uh, feature on the side of the planet. You can see the dark band uh, of terrain to the left of the heart-shaped feature. Uh, a few days later, we took this image here. You can see the backside of Pluto. This is the best uh, observations we have of the backside of Pluto up here on the uh, upper left. And you can see it's it's got a bunch of little ringlets. And these are craters from, from impacts. Uh, and they're scattered all around. And you can see on the bottom part here, a broken up dark area. And the lower right is just off to the side. You can see the heart-shaped uh, feature starting to come around from the left side. And then the day of the flyby, the day before the flyby, or I'm sorry, the day of the flyby, we had this image. This is a true color image of uh, Pluto. Uh, the colors are enhanced a little bit to, to, to differentiate the, the ground features. For the most part, to your eye, it looks mostly tan, but all these colors are there. The dark band has, has a reddish cast to it. The uh, heart has you know a tannish cast on one side, the light bluish on the other. And there's all this stuff that's going on in this little world here that we're about to fly past. Uh, so we gave some, uh, we got some names for it. There's more names now. But the, the heart-shaped region, uh, the tan section is called Sputnik Planitia, and it turns out to be a giant nitrogen glacier, something we had no, we had never dreamed we would ever see on anything, a glacier, much less a giant nitrogen one. Uh, the dark area to the left is, you know, uh, methane areas, there's, there's mountain ranges. The Pluto's geography and geology is vastly diverse. You've got the, the nitrogen glacier, you can see the flows of the ices along the edges. You can see the mountain ranges uh, along the edges here and how the glaciers broken up into these, these giant nodules that uh, we, everything, you know, we're getting only a snapshot when we're flying by, but we suspect this is basically like a lava lamp uh, activity where these giant nodules are slowly bubbling up and then drifting off into the crevices between. Uh, some more images of some mountains here. Uh, the, the cryovolcano that if you uh, were on early enough to see the intro video, they talk about there's two cryovolcanoes here that at some point in the past had erupted. And here's a, an ice lake, a frozen lake uh, in the midst of uh, one of the mountain ranges. There's a lot going on here. There's so much more that I didn't even show you because there's it would take an entire hour to talk about it at you know at this level, but we got more things to discuss. Uh, real quickly, just to give you some statistics, uh, we flew past Pluto at thirty-two thousand miles an hour. We had a specific little box window we had to fly the spacecraft through, and we had to plan to fly the spacecraft through that point or, or that box nine and a half years before we actually got there. That box is about sixty by ninety miles wide. And we missed the very center of the box by 26 miles. Uh, so that the, the navigation team planned, planned all this out. And the, the equivalent of how far we missed the center of the box is if you were to shoot an arrow from New York to Los Angeles, hit a statue in the forehead, shoot a second arrow, split the first arrow, shoot a third arrow, and miss by a millimeter, that's how close we were to being dead center. Also, the timing is critical about when we arrive. Because again, we have to plan all the observations that the spacecraft is going to do ahead of time. We're too far away to joystick the spacecraft. It takes radio waves, which travel at the speed of light, uh, over four hours to get to Pluto. It's like four and a half hours to get there. And a, then a return signal would take four and a half hours to come back. So if you wanted to point the spacecraft at this spot on the planet, you'd have to either know where the planet is going to be and where the spacecraft is going to be long before it actually got there, uh, 
and and or or try and tell it to do that four and a half hours early, but then you'd have to tell it to do everything else four and a half hours early also. And the spacecraft can't talk to you or can't even get signals because it's not pointing the high gain antenna towards Earth. So this is this is this is challenging stuff that we had to do. Uh, the best images that we got from Pluto, uh, we have resolutions of 80 meters to a pixel. And for Charon, which is on the far side of Pluto when we flew past, about 800 meters uh, per pixel. And Pluto has an atmosphere. We, we knew that Pluto had an atmosphere from occultation studies, but to see it imaged like this, you can see the haze layers here. This isn't a JPEG artifact. These are actual haze layers in the atmosphere. And the way we were able, the, the reason why we flew behind both Pluto and Charon was to do atmospheric measurements to see how, how high the atmosphere extended above Pluto's surface and whether or not Charon had one. These are light curves, uh, basically the radio uh, attenuation signal from New Horizons as it passed behind Pluto. You can see it drops off and as it's going through the atmosphere, and then it plummets when it goes behind Pluto, then it suddenly appears again, and then gradually, but rapidly, uh, the signal gets stronger. As we're going past uh, behind Charon, the signal is very strong all the way up to the point where we went behind Charon, and then when we came out from behind Charon, it, bam, was strong again. There's no atmosphere on Charon. So we can say that definitively. Now, in 1988, Pluto had reached the, the closest point in its orbit to the sun. So it's, it has been going through its uh, mid-late summer period over the last uh, 30 or so years. But it's starting to cool off. It's autumn now. Uh, so temperatures are starting to drop, which means the atmosphere is starting to freeze out. And in 100 years, that atmosphere is going to be pretty much all frozen out. We're not going to be able to detect anything there because it's all going to be frozen gas uh, solid on the surface. Now, Charon, uh, Charon was discovered in 1978. Um, and for years before its actual discovery, astronomers had, who had been studying Pluto saw a bump in their observations, as you see here on the, on the left, this little uh, bump right here. And then the center image, there's no bump. But that bump would periodically be there. And astronomers thought, it's, a, it's an artifact in my, det uh, my detector. I'm throwing this data away. It's nothing important because I want to see the actual planet itself until this gentleman right here, Jim Christie, recognized that bump appeared with regularity all the time. And he surmised, what if it's a moon that's orbiting Pluto? So astronomers got all excited and said, oh, cool, let's check it out. And they found that, yes, there's an object out there with Pluto, but it's not orbiting Pluto. It's, again, it's orbiting a, a center point that's between Pluto and itself. So they're, and they're tightly locked together. So they're always facing each other. Charon, interestingly enough, is on the far side of Pluto from the nitrogen glacier Sputnik Planitia. Uh, one of the theories that's uh, been discussed is that at some time in the past, perhaps there was a, a, uh, a, a huge impact event that happened where Sputnik Planitia is. And a bunch of material was thrown off and that's what's filled, and what's filled in the crater is what is now the nitrogen glacier. And Charon is, is on the far side of that. So it never um, you know, saw that impact. Uh, but the other moons of Pluto, uh, may be remnants from that impact. Uh, here's the, it, the best image we have of Charon. You can see it's got a lot of uh, geologic and geographic features to itself. There's a lot more cratering there. And if you zoom in on like one of the uh, canyon areas, you can see that at some point in the past, there were avalanches. Uh, what caused the avalanches? Uh, what precipitated things to do this, what the material is made of exactly, we don't know. We do know that Charon is made of water, ice, and some other uh, materials. And this is the last view we have of Charon as we were flying away. It's backlit by Pluto, which is how you can see the, uh, the dark side of Charon.
These are the other four companions in the system. They're all moons of Pluto. Uh, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. Styx is the smallest. It's like, it's akin to the moons of Mars. It's about the same size as the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Nix and Hydra are a little bit larger than those. And uh, for scale, there's Charon on the bottom, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. Uh, there for, again, for scale. And we've done some reflectivity studies and we understood from this that Nix is basically pure water ice. Hydra is very much water ice with some uh, contaminants in it. And Curon has a water ice signature also, but there's additional contaminants on the surface of that world as well. So that's uh, your quick, uh, what? 15 minutes study to uh, the Pluto system, but we're not done. New Horizons wasn't gonna just stop or stop and turn around. We were, con we're continuing on through the uh, solar system. We're flying out through the Kuiper Belt. And we're gonna be eventually leaving the solar system. Uh, so while we're in the Kuiper Belt, we're exploring. We're taking ob observations of other Kuiper Belt objects out there. We're discovering new Kuiper Belt objects out there. But one of the things we wanted to do was do a flyby of another Kuiper Belt object, if we could do so. So we spend an incredible amount of time using ground-based telescopes to see if there's anything down our trajectory path that we might be able to uh, fly past. Couldn't see anything with ground-based telescopes. So we had to finally employ the Hubble telescope to look and look and look and look. And finally it found a couple objects. The decision was made to fly past this particular one called 2014 MU69. Uh, this image here, was taken by Hubble over a, a period of this five images over a period of 10 minutes. Uh, it's very, very faint. It blends into the background noise almost. Uh, it's that's 27th magnitude. For those of you who know how faint that is, that's that's pretty faint. And spectral analysis suggested that it's it's probably reddish in nature, but you can't tell that directly. So what we could do with ground-based telescopes is do occultation studies, where an occultation is when a foreground object, such as an asteroid, or in this case, MU69, passes in front of a background star that is um, brighter than the object. As the foreground object passes in front of it, it blocks the light out from the background star for a moment. It could be for a fraction of a second or a few seconds or whatever, and then it appears. So what you do is you get a bunch of telescopes and set them up on a predicted path on Earth perpendicular to the path that the object is going to take when it passes in front of the star. And then you see all these lines here are chords or observations of when the star was visible and when it disappeared and when it, was, uh, when it reappeared again. And from that, you can get a rough shape of what the object looks like. So we did that with uh, MU69 in June 2017, July 2017, August 2018. We had a number of occultation studies uh, to perform of MU69. Uh, the first attempt, June 3rd, total miss. All the telescopes we set up, none of them saw anything. On the June 10th attempt, uh, we had one hit. We had the SOFIA uh, Flying Observatory, and it got an occultation. So we, we, we had a better idea of where the object was in the sky. So the June 17th attempt, seven days later, we had uh, 25 telescopes set up, all these, these color cords right here, and five of them got hits. They, they saw the occultation event happen. And from that, here on the right, you can see where the, the star disappeared and where it reappeared from the different telescopes. And the team looked at it and said, hey, this looks like it's a binary object. And either these are two objects orbiting together or they're close enough they may be a contact binary. We didn't know for certain, but this is what we, we suspected. And if we, we put the upper parameters to be no more than 30 or 40 kilometers long, the individual lobes or objects would be 10 to 20 kilometers in diameter or so. So with this knowledge, we're flying in, 
our closest approach to uh, the object was uh, 1233 in the morning on January 1st. So we celebrated New Year's and 30 minutes later, we celebrated the flyby. At this distance, it takes light and radio waves over six hours just to get traverse from Earth to the spacecraft or back. So the RTLT is round trip light time. And that's how long it takes for us to send a signal and get a return back. Uh, our, now our planned uh, trajectory is to put us closer than we did when we flew past Pluto. So we were hoping to get a much better resolution images that we got at Pluto. And Pluto was pretty, pretty good to begin with. Um, so this is our, our flight path out from Earth and then past Pluto. All the objects in yellow you see here are objects that we had studied on the way out. NU69 is right here in uh, noted by white, and we were going to fly right past it. All the other objects uh, surrounding us were not close enough for us to adjust the course of the spacecraft to go past. So as we're zooming in on NU69, we had to do a number of course correction maneuvers or trajectory correction maneuvers, TCMs, just to nudge the spacecraft ever so slightly to make sure that we were going to intersect with the region of NU69. Now, this is not easy to do. I mean, you, you look at space missions like the landing of the Mars rovers and uh, Perseverance and flying a helicopter on Mars, the orbiting another planet like Jupiter or Saturn. Uh, the teams make it look easy, but it takes years to plan for this. And to give you a very rough analogy, say you're in New York, and you fire a gun in the general direction of the West Coast. So let's assume the bullet doesn't drop. It just keeps traveling across the United States. Now, instantaneously move yourself to Miami. The bullet's still traveling from where you shot it in New York, but you've now moved. You're someplace else. And you detect a marble on top of a car. It's on a suction cup, so it doesn't roll much. That's moving on a highway through Portland. And you don't know which lane it is, but you want that bullet to slip right past that, that marble. Oh so you've God. got to tell the bullet, and it has tiny little wings on it to adjust its trajectory, but it doesn't have big wings, so it can't do a lot. From the angle you're looking at, to guess where the bullet is, to guess where the, the uh, marble is, to try and get them to intersect. And that's what our navigation team does. Uh, in addition, the, the light levels at, uh, at the MU69 were way lower than on Pluto. The midday on Pluto, the brightness on the surface of Pluto at midday is as bright as it is on Earth five minutes after sunset. So tomorrow, if it's clear, go outside at five minutes after sunset, and that's as bright as it is at noon on Pluto. It's much deeper twilight when we're getting to MU69. We're also trying to fly closer. Uh, the target's much smaller. and uh, where we have an older spacecraft, we don't have as much resources, we have lower bandwidth. There's a lot of challenges that go into flying past an object. It took us two years to plan this out. In addition, we didn't know if we were looking at one object, two objects, or were there two primary objects and a cluster of smaller rocks surrounding it. So a month away, we started doing a very deep, intensive campaign with the spacecraft to look at the object and see if we could detect anything else. If there was anything else around the object, we would have time to adjust the trajectory of the spacecraft so we would steer clear of any debris fields. Because you don't want to hit a rock going at 36,000 miles an hour. It would be a bad day for all of us. So we looked and looked and looked. We didn't see anything. So we continued on our uh, primary trajectory. Now, this is the star field we were looking into to see the object. And to, in order to pick out MU69 from all the background stars, we're looking basically into the heart of the Milky Way, into the Sagittarian star cloud. We had to take multiple images and then subtract out anything that didn't move so we could see the actual object itself. Again, not, not an easy thing to do. 
Uh, we did not fly behind the objects. Our trajectory just wasn't going to allow for that. We flew over it. Again, we flew uh, 2,200 miles of, of over the surface of it. Uh, and this is our timeline that we had through closest approach. And shortly after, a few days uh, after we did closest approach, everything went behind the sun and we lost contact with the spacecraft for a few days. But we were able to get some early images down. This gives you an idea of how close we were. If MU69 were the surface of Earth, this is how close we flew. And up here, this is an actual scale size to Earth of how big MU69 or Arakoff, as the official name is. So 20 hours before closest approach, this is what we saw. Mm. And we saw it rotating on its axis like this. And the one, the image on the left is as we're approaching, the image on the right has been scaled so it stays uh, the same relative size. Uh, color images, the Lori camera does black and white. The Envy camera was able to give us some color and we were able to superimpose the two, merge them. And so we, we verified that yes, Arakoff is a fairly reddish object. It's made of the ancient uh, material from the origins of our solar system. Uh, the two lobes, we call them Ultima and Thule, uh, they basically have the same uh, coloration throughout, uh, mostly reddish with some modulations of darker colors and lighter colors. Uh, and it appears that these two objects, they form from a pebble accretion model uh, where at the beginning of the solar system, you had all these rocks and pebbles kind of spinning around each other and they, some would accrete to make larger objects, others would get thrown out just due to the dynamics of the system. And then these two large objects that remained slowly got together and docked and merged together, which is, forms what we have now of Arakov. Arakov uh, compared to some of the mountains on Pluto, you know, it's size comparable. Uh, 30 minutes for a closest approach. This is what we saw. 19 minutes, you get a little bit better view. And six and a half minutes, one of the best images we have. You can see some craters along the rim. You can see the uh, left uh, component has a big dent in it. And the right component has a, kind of a, a, a concentric uh, rings here, along with other smaller dents. Originally, we thought these were roundish shaped objects because they kind of, especially the one on the left, kind of looks round. But as we learned when we flew past, these aren't round. These are these are fairly flat. One's basically a dented walnut, and the other is basically a fat pancake. Just and they're merged together. The geography and the geology of these two objects is incredibly complex. There's pits, there's troughs, there's, there's hills. They're not formed like uh, hills on Earth, but th there's hills there. There's bright areas, there's dark areas. There's all kinds of different materials here. Um, some details here, again, we launched the spacecraft in Jan January 9th, 2006. Almost uh, 17 years later, we did the flyby of Arakoth. We traveled 4 billion miles for this. And we traveled within 2,200 miles of the surface. And we got images at range 33 meters to a pixel. Our downlink rate though at this distance is getting pitifully low. Uh, the further out we go, the lower the downlink, we don't have the power on the spacecraft to push higher uh, transmission rates down. So things take a long time. It took us over a year, almost a year and a half to get all the images down from Arakoth that we needed. So some Arakoth stats, it's 33 by almost 18 kilometers in, uh, in, in, in length and width. Again, shaped like a pancake on one side, a dented walnut on the other side, it's reddish. It's made of the primordial uh, material from when we first, when our solar system first formed. And it rotates on its axis every 15 or 16 uh, hours. Uh, there's no major craters on there other than the big dented walnut, suggesting that not much has happened to it since it's formed. It's been out there pretty much isolated and serene for all these millennia. 
Now we're continuing on. We're past Erekoth now by over a year, um, almost three years coming this January. Last year, we did a campaign to demonstrate uh, parallax studies from a massive baseline. For those who don't, of you who don't know, parallax is a technique used to measure relatively nearby stars. The limit that we can do this is about 100 parsecs or a little more than 300 light years. You get further than that, we can't tell um, the star shifting from one end of Earth's orbit to the other end of Earth's orbit. We can't see that angle very well. But with New Horizons, we're now 46 times further out from the sun than we were uh, than from Earth. So we now have a huge baseline with which to look at parallaxes. And we could see much further than 100, uh, or, uh, 100 parsecs. Unfortunately, we're also moving and we're not a stationary op uh, observatory. So this is more just a proof of concept. Uh, so we looked at two different stars. Uh, we looked at Proxima Centauri and Wolf 359 or 359. Uh, the Proxima Centauri uh, relative to Earth and uh, New Horizons was just under three light hours closer to Earth than it was to New Horizons. And Wolf 359 was just under four hours closer to New Horizons than it was to Earth. So if we wanted to make pure observations from Earth and from the spacecraft, we had to take the observations at different times, uh, taking into account the time differential due to uh, the light hours difference. And the reason to do this, other than just uh, for the aesthetics of the demonstration, is to also it mitigates uh, proper motion. When you're doing uh, parallax studies from Earth, you take an, option, an, an image and then you take another image six months later. Well, that star has moved in that time. It may or may not be perceptible. If it's perceptible, then that's going to throw your parallax uh, measurements off. And you have to take multiple uh, images over years to uh, mitigate the, the proper motion and just get the true parallax measure. From here, doing it this way, we could do uh, straight up parallax. So a target star, Wolf 359, was a dot in the middle. Uh, again, the dot in the middle, here's Proxima Centauri and it's a sky chart. And this is uh, Wolf 359 here and Proxima Centauri, the uh, image from the, uh, the spacecraft, or I mean, from the ground and the, the yellow, uh, the, uh, sorry, the green circle, uh, here, 359, is where New Horizons saw the star to be. So you can see the dramatic shift in the sky from the two, from the parallax. Here, you can see the GIF uh, of 359 from Earth and New Horizons as it shifts. So we're looking at us, we're in a place of space where the stars are already starting to shift their positions in the sky relative to what we see here on Earth, which is really kind of cool. But we're not done and we're running out of time. Um, it's a, here's a stereo image. If you can cross your eyes and do the whole stereoscopic uh, view, uh, you should be able to see uh, Proxima Centauri pop out a little bit from the background stars. I can't do it. And since we're running out of time, I'm not going to uh, hold the slide up for long. So if you're watching the video afterwards, you can freeze it and then do, the, uh, this, do your eye crossing thing. Continuing on, um, challenging of, of looking at things in the Kuiper belt, um, the light is fainter. We, we don't have, uh, you know, the, the sun is fainter, so we don't have as much light uh, reflecting off of the objects out there. It takes longer exposure times. We're pushing the telescope, uh, the LORI uh, imager, which is an eight inch telescope, basically to its limits of what it can do. Uh, we have to take hundreds of images of an object, and then we have to, to compress them to one fifth size, crop them down, and then transmit all this data back to Earth, and then co-add everything together. Because of our low data rates, even cropping them down to one fifth size, it, it takes weeks to get the data down for just one object that we're looking at. So all this time, the years that have been going on since Pluto to Erikoff, Erikoff to now, we've been busy looking at other things in the Kuiper belt. 
and we'll call your attention to two of them. This was just released last week. This is about as hot off the presses as you can get it for a presentation. Uh, is two Kuiper Belt objects, JY31 and OS393. They're called tight twins. From Earth, they just look like dots, if they can be seen at all. But from where we are in the Kuiper Belt, we can actually see uh, on the lower band here, um, JY31 on the left, OS393 on the center, and a nearby star of comparable brightness on the right. And you can see that JY31 and OS393 are slightly elongated relative to what the star looks like, which suggests that, hey, this is probably a pair of objects orbiting each other. So, you know, we take these intense studies and on the top here, we apply models to account for a single object or a pair of objects. If we take an image and the top model here is JY31 and we apply a single model uh, to the image, we still get bands of brightness above and below it, which says there's still unaccounted for mass out there. If we apply a two body model to it, it takes care of all the brightness and accounts for all of what we're seeing. And if you wait a couple of days later and you see it uh, rotate uh, on, on, you know, in their orbit relative to each other, you see it's tilted. Again, the single body model produces lobes of brightness, but the two body model takes care of all that, which tells us we have a binary system here. And it turns out uh, they're very, very close. JY31 has a separation of 120 miles. OS393 has a separation of 93 miles. They orbit in less than two days, each of them. JY31 was 0.15 astronomical units away from the spacecraft or 14 million miles away when we took the observations. And OS393 was, 0 0.09 or a little more than 8 million miles away, one of the closest things that we've passed by. Now, how did these come about? Again, they're, they're part of the what we call the cold classicals, the original primordial uh, material from our solar system. Uh, again, they come from pebble accretion, and pebble accretion can account for both Erikoff and these two objects. If things form just right and the masses of the two objects pull each other together, we get a docked uh, bin a contact binary like Erikoff. But if they're not, if they're just far enough apart and they just orbit each other, then we get basically a, a binary system like JY31 and OS393. So what's next for New Horizons? Well, again, we're still traveling through the Kuiper Belt. We're getting to the end of the Kuiper Belt. Remember the Kuiper Belt is 30 to 50, give or take astronomical units from the sun. We're now about 51 astronomical units from Earth. So we're leaving the Kuiper Belt. But what's beyond the Kuiper Belt? We don't know. Uh, so we're, we're looking to see what's downrange from us to see if there's anything else that we might be able to detect. And our hope is that we can find something that we can do a third flyby. That would be awesome to fly by yet another object out there. However, we don't have infinite amount of fuel. There's not been a gas station for five billion miles. So the fuel we have, which we started out with uh, was, oh, I can't remember now how much, how many kilograms we had. We're down to nine kilograms of fuel at this point, which isn't a lot. That's barely enough for a flyby and all the trajectory correction maneuvers that need to be accounted for, plus turn the spacecraft back to Earth and dump the data down. We can't use the uh, telescope on New Horizons because that would use fuel that we need to do for the flyby. So we have to use large telescopes here on Earth or space-based telescopes, whichever we can get our hands on. We're also looking again into the heart of the Sagittarian star cloud. So finding anything is going to be an extremely challenging task. Um, the odds are stacked heavily against us, but if we don't try, we automatically miss. If you're in a dice game with, uh, you know, like a board game, and you need to throw dice and you decide I'm not going to throw these dice because it's not going to work unless I roll a, you know, a single digit 
a, a one on a six sided die. If you don't throw that dice, you automatically lose that that time. If you throw it and you get that one, you 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 scored. So that's what we're hoping is we we throw the dice and we get a target. So that's where we are now. And you can follow the continuing adventures of Pluto and New Horizons, well, mainly New Horizons at this website here. Thank you very much. Wow, excellent. Excellent. Uh, I have asked our audience if they have any particular questions. Um, there, was, uh, there was a question here from Norm Hughes. Uh, he said, how do they determine the type of ice on a planet or moon when we haven't actually been there? Um, we can do spectral studies. Uh, so we know, you know, the wavelength, the, the, the light coming in from the sun that bounces off, we know it gets absorbed or not. Uh, and so we can see the spectra of what the reflected uh, light is that we can determine the chemical composition. Right. Um, there are, uh, we have lots of amateur astronomers in our, uh, in our chat here. And I know that you're an amateur astronomer too. We were talking about your um, telescopes. Um, uh, one question is, is, you know, what would, be, what would be the best telescope that you can think of? <laughs> <laughs> this is a hard question. Uh, uh, to see Pluto and, uh, well, just to see Pluto. Uh, from an amateur astronomer's point? Yes. Well, it's 14th magnitude, so you need a, a telescope that could see down to that level. And I don't remember how, how large that would be, 12 inches maybe? Yeah, that would be about right. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you're looking at through the eyepiece, you're just going to see a bunch of dots, star fields. And you'd have to have a really good finder chart or take an image and then come back a couple of days later, take another image and see which one moved. That's and right. then you can point an arrow to it and show somebody. Occasionally, Sky and Telescope magazine or Astronomy magazine will publish uh, where it is. Okay, but mm -hmm. the, these days also we have many. You know, we have software that can show us exactly where it is in a star field, and so it would be very handy to press uh, print out something very fresh and go out there and try to determine it. That's how I found Pluto uh, with my Newtonian telescopes. Um, I'm still old school enough. I keep forgetting about all these, uh, the software options. <laughs> right, right. Yep. Um, I, I kind of, I was starting kind of at the, at the beginning of all that stuff, about 1980, you know, uh, starting with a, a larger Newtonian telescope. Um, let's see, there is another question here. Um, That's a deep question. Yes. And Caitlin's dancing in the background. <laughs> I am, but no one can see me, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm curious about um, myself, about the, uh, you know, the, the, the cycle of uh, ices and, and that whole dynamic of, of how they freeze and, you know, the, the atmosphere goes away, you know, is, is it, you know, uh, it would seem to me that uh, when spring comes, it must be like this bloom uh, that occurs of uh, crystals in its atmosphere. And, uh, you know, so we have crystals, but what's, what's the atmosphere in between the crystals, you know, that, that are, is, are they just kind of floating up and create an atmosphere? Or is there, are there gases that are sublimating? You know, what's happening? Basically, yeah, basically that's what it is. Gases that are uh, solids that are sublimating into gases. Okay, like a comet. In a, yeah, like, like a, a comet. comet. Or if you go out to a lake some early morning and you see this, the, the steam rising off the lake. I see. Very interesting. That's, that's a terrestrial analog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I got a, a fun quick question then. Uh, from oh, your God. slide, I know. Uh, from your slide regarding the flyby stats, uh, and you were talking about just hitting that that box just right. Um, I'm curious as to what would have happened if we accidentally missed that box, that window. <laughs> if we missed the box by either physically missing the box or we mistimed the encounter, 
we wouldn't have seen anything of what we saw. Oh, man. Um, again, we have to pre-program the command sequence of what the spacecraft's going to do during that time. So we have to point it. We have to tell the spacecraft to point here. You're going to look at what's there. And then you have to point here. Then you have to, oh, now you have to point here at this time. But now you have to point here at this time. If you're off by like two minutes, those objects are not where you are pointing. You're going to go through the motions, but you're not necessarily going to get what you wanted. Oh, that sounds <laughs> stressful. <laughs> it's, it's a little stressful, yes. Um, oh, gosh. At least Pluto was a big object. Erikoff, tiny object. And um, on our planning team, we have four people who do the planning for the spacecraft. And so we rotate uh, doing the command schedules. And it takes us around 10 weeks to make a command load uh, that's about two weeks long for the spacecraft. So you know we're staggered over this 10-week period with four of us building command loads. The woman who was doing the command load for the flyby of Erikoth took two years exclusively to work on it while we did all the other commanding in the meantime. Her hair went gray. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. And, and but we got to Erikoth on a New Year's, too. So that was very exciting as well that it was it was ringing in the new year. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and getting right at Erikoth and going, what in the world is this object? <laughs> you know, there are um, there's a question about uh, Pluto's uh, categories of planet. And you said you wouldn't get into this. Um, okay, we can now. But, <laughs> it's very controversial in the way that it, the, the whole thing was arrived at anyways, but but uh, it is still classed as a planet, just a category of planets, a dwarf planet, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah. it, that they're all worlds, you know, so that, that's... Whenever that's, someone asks me, yeah. is Pluto a planet? My response is, and this isn't to, to argue with them, but to challenge them to think about the, the question is, define planet, right? Can you define what a planet is? And does Pluto then fit what your definition of what a planet is? Right. And uh, I've done a few talks on what is a planet. And I've enjoyed always opening the talk up with asking the audience, okay, I want you to tell me, and I'd have a whiteboard beside me, Oh, okay. What your definition of a planet is. Yeah. You know, okay. So I go to a, you know astronomy club and sure. you know, there'd be 25, 30 people in the room. And I say, okay, someone tell me your definition of a planet. What can, what makes a planet? And someone will say, uh, it has to be round. Okay. Uh, it has to have a moon. Okay. It has to have an uh, atmosphere. Okay. Whatever they tell me, I write it all down. Yes. And then we discuss it. I see. And then That's going by approach. those, just those definitions alone, Mercury is already out because there's no moon. Venus would be out. There's no moon. Right. Exactly. What's, considered, I, I, what's considered a definition of a moon? Right. So, captured so the idea is to get them to think about it a little bit. Sure. Exactly. Uh, so, oh, right. Mercury doesn't have a moon, but it's a planet or Venus. And so they start, they start to understand the challenge of defining what it is. Right. Well, there's a lot, we, you know, most of us have a very emotional attachment of what we call planets. Okay. That, that is, that is part of it as well. Um, but as we learn more about the universe we live in and uh, the questions that, that, uh, that have been asked and, and the, the new questions that we have now, uh, uh, you know, our whole uh, idea of what planets are in particular, um, you know, have already changed and they'll change in the future as well, mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, yeah, so, they will. Right? right? When I listened to Mike Brown give his talk, he said, you know, it may end up that we have 70 or 80 planets, you know, right. so. And right. one an argument now, I think it was Mike Brown who brought this up on a radio talk show, and I think he was joking, but both sides of the debate clinched on it. Mm. We can't have too many planets. What 
we have 13 or 15 planets if you count Maki Maki and Haumea and Orcus and Charon and Verona and Seta and Eris. And that's too many planets. We can't do that. But think about how many states are in the United States and can you name them? <laughs> That's 50 right. states. So, okay. What about the capitals? Can you name all them? <laughs> so. I can't name them all, but it, how important is it that we be able to name all right. 23 planets or eight planets or whatever? Right. And now let's open up exoplanets, you know? So, yeah. there's planets everywhere, you know? And all everywhere. The worlds. That's right. Um, all right. And so, uh, Michael Hudak, watching on Facebook, says When do you expect the end of the New Horizons mission to be? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, Whether from fuel or from power. Okay, from power, we have enough power to last until the 2030s. Wow, okay. Fuel is another uh, kettle of fish. And we are actually actively discussing how are we going to uh, mitigate the fuel usage on the spacecraft right now going forward. Because we have nine kilograms left, which isn't a lot. Mm. And there's a lot the scientists want to do. I bet. So the, the discussions of what we are going to do going forward are happening now. And I'm hoping if we have a Star Quest next summer, Caitlin, uh, Star Party in uh, West Virginia, the Green Bank, uh, I will be able to present what we're doing now with New Horizons at that point. Very cool. Very cool. That would be cool. I, real quick, I'm going to I, I embarrass uh, Mark a little bit, though. Um, so with his amazing accomplishments of being part of the New Horizons team, he also got an asteroid named after him as well. Uh, I had to go find the specific number, too, because it's 168767-COCTE. So I want to know, like, how... Uh, what was your reaction when you got that email? Well, uh, we were actually prepped ahead of time. Uh, we were told that the team members were all getting asteroids named after them who were involved oh, wow. in the the flyby of Pluto. Nice. So <laughs> it was just a matter of, you know, we get an, an email and 20 names would be on it. And a few weeks later, we get another email, 20 more names would be on it. And everyone's like, oh, is my name on there? Is my name on there? <laughs> And for cool. me, it was more like, oh, okay, my name's under. I don't have to worry about the next email now. <laughs> did you have to like look it up to like what your, what your so you made your access was, what's your information? And it didn't have anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so little information. It's like, ah. Uh. <laughs> Go contact Mark Bowie. He's the one who discovered the asteroid. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, he's the one who he, he's the one who had the idea of naming asteroids after people on the mission. Nice. Yeah, okay. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, okay, let's see if there's another question here. Well, you know, while you're look, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Caitlin. Well, I was gonna do a, a quick, uh, some quick book plugs though for those who are interested in New Horizons uh, or just Pluto in general. There's uh, some fantastic books out there if you wanna know more about um, uh, the New Horizons, like behind the scenes and how it, it's, it got started. Oh, so we both had different books here. <laughs> so uh, this is Chasing New Horizons. Um, this is a book by Alan Stern, the uh, uh, principal investigator, the PI of New Horizons, and David Grinspoon. So fantastic book to kind of go behind the scenes. Yeah. And there's well, an, audio an audio book too. Yeah. It's and, an uh, and I see, I see Scott has his. Uh, his fancy uh, University of Arizona Press uh, right. Pluto textbook. <laughs> it's a hefty thing, uh, a hefty but thing. Uh, it is available as a hardback or as an ebook on University of Arizona Press. <laughs> awesome. I don't have that book. I have ah. the other one. You have I have the other one, and it's signed by Alan. Nice. I, I still need to get mine signed by Alan uh, for sure, though. Um, but yeah, so nice, nice, hefty, hefty book. I need to get you a copy of this, though. But I, uh, yeah. Yeah, some light reading. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
there's thanks to you, Caitlin, for arranging uh, to have Mark speak, um, which is great. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Caitlin, but I met Mark at a winter star party in Chiefland uh, years ago. Um, and uh, so I thought he gave a great presentation at that time too. So, but um, uh, I, you know, I want to commend both of you guys because, uh, uh, you know, I may have said it before, but um, there, there are planetary scientists who, uh, uh, or just scientists in general, that are so involved with their research that they have little time to communicate that to the public. Uh, but both of you have done an amazing job you know, and doing that. So, and I, and I know that, uh, uh, you do it because, um, you know, you understand the benefit of it and the, uh, and the responsibility of that. So it's really, it's wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. And there was one last question. Harold Locke is asking, he's watching on YouTube. He said, did you read the article today about the totally dead sun that has one uh, has one gas giant planet r rotating ab around it. I, I didn't know about this. No, I didn't. I actually, I spent most of my day dealing with my next command load. <laughs> okay. Well, keep reading, keep reading out there and maybe you'll learn more, you know, there's yeah. so many, we're in this golden age of astronomy and discovery right now that with, with all of the planetary missions that are going on, uh, you know, uh, it's, it would be impossible to keep track of all of it, you know, and there's, there must be a new discovery happening every couple of days, you know, yeah. so. And we have, we have missions going up, darts going up to direct asteroid, the, the redirect the mission. Uh, JWST is going up later this year. Right. So yeah. yeah. It's exciting to it's exciting get all graded up and shipped. And apparently it's arrived in France, I think is where it is. So. So it's, it's one of oh, JWST. It's in the French Guyana, French Guyana. Okay. There we go. France, French Guyana. They both begin with that far. Yeah. Still <laughs> on planet earth, right? Yeah. I hope so. Well, for now, for now, that's right. <laughs> Hopefully Wonderful. not for long. <laughs> well, is there any, um, closing statements? Any. Thank you everyone for coming out and watching and for those of you who weren't able to come because you were working or something this evening and are watching this later i hope you enjoyed it yep thank you very much and um okay well uh thanks again and uh caitlin yeah, thank you uh, scott for having us and thank you caitlin for dragging me out to talk again <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Mark, uh, for uh, you know being dragged out of the shadows, and, and always a pleasure to learn about Pluto uh, and the excitement of New Horizons too. Um, and thank you everybody for listening in for seven months of science. I like I said, next month is our final, our grand finale of seven months of science already. Wow, that has gone by so quickly. Um, so keep an eye out for that for uh, our next speaker and uh, stay tuned. And thank you again, Scott, for being my awesome co-host. And I, listeners and watchers, I, I please go uh, look at the calendar on Explore Scientific because there's still a lot of awesome events to come up. And especially this Saturday, which is International Observe the Moon Night. Yes. <laughs> Woo! That's right. So. We have the Lucy launch on Saturday. We have International Observe the Moon uh, night on uh, Saturday. There must be a couple of other things going on. So, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, sure it's never are. boring in the world of astronomy and space exploration. So, uh, you know, uh, keep uh, following uh, uh, the science and uh, the um, announcements, and uh, we'll do our best to try to keep up with that too. Take care and you guys have a great night and keep looking up. Thank you.